Hello and welcome to Ethics and Moral Problems. My name is Dr. Stephen Boyno. Uh, this lecture is on maternal and fetal care. We'll do it from a philosophical point of view. Um, we'll start with maternal care, but specifically uh, reproductive technologies. We'll investigate that a little bit before we move on to talking about um, the ethics of prenatal testing. And then we will get to personhood and bodily autonomy, uh, specifically in terms of the abortion issue. This by no way is going to be any exhaustive consideration of these topics, um, but I hope that it's at least thorough enough that with no intention to change anybody's position, it's going to at least bring up the issues that many do not consider um, and just make it more nuanced, as most things that are will find is simply a matter of competing interest or competing principles, something in that regard. Let's just talk in the beginning here the fact that birth is regardless of um, how great our technology is, never a risk-free um, event. In developed countries, but particularly the United States, it would be quite um, rare um, today to have maternal deaths as compared to, say, 100 years ago. But in underdeveloped countries, um, it still is very risky. Now, the reality of this is, historically, there's a bit of a paradox in the sense that we are usually used to understanding that the poor and the marginalized do not simply have um, advantages that the rich and privileged do. But in terms of pregnancies, uh, the poor tended um, to fare better, at least through the 1800s and the early 1900s. Let me briefly exp explain. So, in the 1800s, it was often the case that physicians, male, um, were not involved necessarily with uh, births. They found it to simply be either a lack of modesty um, or perhaps um, not work that they were interested in. It, messy. I don't mean to be glib like that, but some of the research, at least historical research, shows that. So the reality was is that when physicians did get involved with childbirth, they were also doing other things, particularly autopsies and working with other bodies, and this was prior to any instances of realizing the benefits of sterilization. So when they would go from um, whatever it is they were doing, let's say autopsy, to uh, dealing with uh, a live birth, they would inadvertently transfer the, uh, let's say, um, bacteria or uh, infection to the female. And therefore, the women who were using uh, physicians for delivery as opposed to midwives had a higher rate of maternal death, which, just as an aside, uh, maternal death could does not simply mean that the woman died right during the actual pregnancy. It could include months later. There's some statistics over the years which even had it within the first year after birth. So it's hard to compare these statistics um, across let's say, you know, um, a 100-year timeline, but nonetheless. So there you have the um, less fortunate who would rely on midwives, and my grandmother was a midwife, not professionally, just simply took care of the neighborhood births. Um, they did not pass on the infections, as did the physicians. And even into the 20th century, what you found was still um, rich, you know, privileged families that could afford the physicians for delivery um, still maintained, even, even after they once realized the necessity for sanitation, they still realized a higher maternal death, and it was because the physician was um, more apt to do an invasive procedure or be more aggressive than the midwife. So just a little bit of an understanding in the past of how um, pregnancy and risk were present and still are present, though obviously not anywhere near they were in the beginning. Now, with reproductive technologies... This is a philosophy course, so what that means is that we can only use reason as a basis for um, reforming a judgment and coming to some conclusion as far as to the argument that we're making. The terms um, procreation and reproduction refer to the same but have different um, nuances. So procreation is literally to create with would be something a theistic um, a position would hold. A reproduction would be something that, you know, it's simply to make another of. The only reason I bring it here is not to make a point of these things. 
But since this is a topic that um, often has religious undertones, it's important for us to understand that philosophy does not exclude anything theistic. What it does exclude is dogmatic statements. So no one is expected to shelve their particular theistic belief simply because they're making a philosophical argument. What they are expected to do is not to use the simple, um, although it may not even be simple, but they cannot simply use the theistic foundations um, to um, argue their point. So I don't think, and I don't want anybody to shelve their beliefs as we move through this. Now, technology, um, again, is anything that's manipulated by the human person for the sake of the human person. And in terms of uh, reproductive technologies, there's been quite an advance. If you know anybody who's had, say, a C-section, uh, think back 100, 150 years, the likelihood of that um, person living would have been uh, low. Um, today, even if we are not so concerned, and again, I'm not concerned in the sense that it's still a, a major medical procedure, but at least we know that it's frequently practiced and therefore uh, relatively safe, and I'm using that word relatively um, purposely. There are couples who cannot seem to conceive. So everyone, it doesn't matter what a person's position is on reproductive technologies, abortion, or bodily autonomy, we know the tragedy of families who are trying to conceive and cannot then here we have to ask if we're going to use technology in order to achieve in a pregnancy you're going to have to determine what ethic it is that you apply because you can see here that at the very least the ontology depending on what you would form as the rule is going to be different than consequentialism which would choose the end so I'm not here to lay out what all of those are simply that there's something there that must be applied why are individuals um, experience infertility, there's many reasons. I have no intent to cover them in any length, but body, body mass index certainly is one of them, sperm count. Um, intersex individuals, like um, let's say the XXY, or um, any individuals who perhaps, uh, let's say, would have under underformed or uh, non-formed uh, primary sexual um, organs would more than likely not be able to um, procreate or reproduce. Uh, uh, the reality is, and I'll leave it there rather than trying to go into any depth on it. And also maternal age. So, you know, the prime uh, age for reproduction for a woman is typically between, you know, say 17 and 24, 25. Uh, but because of careers and such, which are important, um, many women are having children into their late 30s. Um, but that also um, does decrease the chances of a successful pregnancy. Now, there are two broad categories that one can bring up when it comes to technologies used to help reproduction, and that is whether or not they are going to be assisted or whether they're therapeutic and try to um, simply uh, move along what isn't doing so well on its own. So, without being exhaustive, um, as far as assistance goes, you can talk about artificial insemination, um, you could talk about natural family planning. The goal there is to complete what nature is not able to do on its own. The therapeutic is, um, let's say, in vitro fertilization or Zifter gift. These are zygote intrafallopian transfer or gamete intrafallopian um, transfer, where they will um, place with Zift the embryo um, through a catheter right into the fallopian tube, and with gift the gametic material, say sperm and uh, oocyte separated by air. Um, through a catheter tube up into the um, fallopian tube. Now, here the difference is, is this is imitating what nature does, but it's doing it artificially. Let's talk just briefly about IVF, um, in vitro fertilization. So, if a couple chooses this, and by the way, same-sex couples, this would be their option. Um, what we'll see is that two females um, could work through a sperm donor. Two males would have to either, um, you know, as opposed to adoption, would have to find uh, some surrogate to carry the child for them. So in IVF, um, the woman is uh, given a means to hyperovulate so that they harvest eggs. And the number of eggs harvesting depends probably on clinic and also on age. But it could be up to 15. 
Um, once these eggs are harvested, then with the sperm and a uh, Petri dish, they are fertilized. Now, back in 1978 was what was known then as the test tube baby. This was the first time that any child was conceived outside of, you know, natural intercourse. Uh, I recall the time it was just something fantastic in the sense that it was so future-oriented it was hard to wrap, you know, our heads around. Today, it's a much more common procedure. So once that the, the um, eggs are fertilized, at this point we have embryos. So this is new gametic material, um, both from, you know, at least two of the parents. At this point, some selection has to occur. Um, we'll talk about that briefly. But not all embryos may appear as healthy, and there's other things that people might want to select out. And at that point, then, it goes to implantation. Implantation, again, the number differs um, by various factors, but it's unlikely to be one. It's usually multiple eggs because um, multiple um, embryos because not all take. And at that point, then, is um, pregnancy. So you'll see that there's a higher instance of um, multiple multi births um, because, in essence, if three embryos were implanted, then conceivably, you know, three embryos can um, start to, um, let's say, work through fetal development, and then you have triplets. Depending on, again, the mother's age and other um, health reasons, or just simply because they desire, so there will be a reduction. Um, this would be um, what others would call an abortion. So usually the multi-fetal births, I'm sorry, multi-fetal um, uh, development, uh, developed um, fetuses, let's leave it at that, you know, roughly around seven to eight weeks. Now, if they harvest even, say, like seven or eight eggs and only implant, you know, two or three, and, and this is a process, and it's not an, um, an inexpensive process. You're talking around roughly $12,000, you know, for this. At this point, then, those embryos that were not utilized in any implantation attempts will be uh, cryopreserved. Now, that itself brings up another issue that we should at least address momentarily here. Uh, if you're going at this from a utilitarian point of view, if we go all the way back to 1978 and you see, well, the goal is, is for um, a couple to have a child that otherwise cannot, so to have an in vitro fertilization and then implantation and the child, um, and you start to weigh out the um, pains and also the pleasures from that, as, uh, say, you know, Jeremy Bentham would have. The one thing that maybe at least at that time nobody considered is what do you do with the cryopreserved embryos? In reality, their future use is unclear. Um, if the implantation is not successful, then yes, they can simply um, go back and uh, fall out um, a few more and give that one another try. As far as the length of viability, you know, this is contested. Um, it was thought 10 years, but recently, I believe in Maryland, I'm not positive on that, uh, a frozen embryo of 18 years was brought through gestation to birth. So if you think in that terms, literally that could be a sibling bringing, well, a person bringing their sibling uh, to through gestation. So if a mother, say in her you know mid-20s, had her embryos uh, cryopreserved, and then they're one of her natural daughters at 18 years of age, took one of those embryos, um, you could have that scenario. I'm not saying that to uh, denounce it. What I'm saying is that these are considerations. We don't know how long these will last. The other thing is that these become property. So um, that's an interesting notion in itself. They belong to the parents. Now, they could be given, donated uh, for research. That brings up another um, consideration, at least ethically. But they also... Um, in the case of a divorce, become part of the divorce settlement. And, you know, I guess you could conceivably split them or one spouse could get them. So the concern there is that this is gametic material from both. If one does have property of them, and this is not un, um, unrealistic that, you know, these become property in divorce, it happens frequently enough, um, then what becomes their future? Um, literally a, 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 a one couple uh, you know, on their second marriage uh, could um, bring to fruition 
a child with genetic material from a previous marriage. Just things to consider. Natural family planning is often um, not known well outside of, I guess, the Catholic Church is maybe one that holds to it. Um, the reality about natural family planning is that every woman has a fertility window. So if a person who was having difficulty conceiving did go to an OBGYN in hopes to um, heighten their chances, the first thing that the gynecologist would do is try to determine the woman's fertility window. And then you would have sexual intercourse during that time. So when a woman ovulates, um, there are... Uh, visible and physical signs that can be recorded. Um, basically, uh, um, mucus excretion, uh, basal body temperature and such. So these are things that can be observed and can also be charted. Roughly, and this is just, you know, generally speaking, um, a, woman, a woman does ovulate. The egg is uh, viable for one day, perhaps two days. Um, during vaginal intercourse, uh, the sperm can live in the vaginal cavity for up to seven days. Perhaps, you know, less, more, depends. But nonetheless, so you, you're you looking um, at having intercourse where if the, um, conceivably, if, this, if you have an intercourse seven days before you ovulate, there's still a chance that you're going to have fertilization. So let's just say for the sake of keeping it simple that there's a nine-day fertility window for women. Outside of that window... Um, the chances, you could always, you know, put a few days on there if you wanted to be certain. And so let's say that you're using this to avoid a pregnancy. Um, the reality is that if you have um, sexual intercourse outside of that fertility window, it's impossible to get pregnant. There's no, um, there's no ovum um, present. So this is both for, um, this is birth control in that sense meant to control one's birth. Now, the downfall on this is you're not going to see unmarried couples or young couples who are this intent on observing their own um, ovulation patterns and then having them, the male respect that. So this requires some biological backing, but also it requires a mature disposition on the part of both. So in other words, fertility is always external for the male, um, and for the woman it's quite internal, obviously. So this draws the male into the woman's fertility cycle, and it has the positive nature there, but it also is something that, done properly, is probably is, um, at least if not in practice, um, it rightly used as effective as hormonal contraception. Um, but that's not the point we're making here today. Now, um, something to think about with these is the actual relationships here. So. We'll talk briefly here um, about sperm donation. Um, there's no legal um, issues that are involved. Usually they're released from anything that may come after that as far as child support and such. Um, but nonetheless, uh, whether the ovum was donated or whether the sperm was donated or whether a surrogate was used, there's always going to be issues that come up between the relationship of all of these. With sperm donation... Um, this could be something that usually it's between, say, 19 and 30, maybe up to 40 years old. Um, uh, a male can receive $100 per donation. Uh, it Also, there might be money involved um, when this leaves the, um, the sperm bank lab. The thing to be concerned about here, if I want to say it that way, is what criteria is used. And I don't mean to sound glib when I say this, but no... Um, you say two uh, uh, women are not going to enter a sperm bank and just ask for whatever. They're going to have specific questions that they want answered. Um, it could be sex. That's at least one thing that could be determined. Um, uh, race, typically. Uh, but also uh, just the genetic health of the donor. Um, educational level. All of those things. Now, something to consider with this is that as good as this is as far as a, a reproductive technology that will allow people who are under other circumstances would not be able to have a child, um, it does make us ask that there is there are choices here. And um, if somebody were to go to a sperm bank, um, and they probably would not want 
any donation from somebody who has, say, well, it wouldn't have gotten that far to begin with, you know, but a deaf person, or which, you know, would, we could literally accuse the person of autism. If you know people in the deaf community, they are quite aware that it's recognized as a disability, but for them, they would want a deaf child, so they would see this as a way of, you know, um, not allowing that. Um, people with cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, and such. Um, there's other things that are, are going to come up. Um, so there's, there's a selection here, and I think that is to be expected. Um, how you feel about it ethically, you, you'll need to work that out. Now, it also is true that sometimes, let's say, um, a woman is able uh, to both conceive and carry the child, but it's found out that she is a carrier for something. There's some disease in her mitochondrial DNA. Um, but she still wants to have her genetic material as part of her offspring. So they could uh, take uh, the nucleus out of, uh, they could have these embryos, take the nu nucleus out of one and then place in the other. In other words, um, circumvent uh, the woman's DNA, mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA, with that of a donor. So what this does is preserve maternal genetics. In the same way they say a same-sex couple might have, if um, one would carry the child and it would be her ovum, the other female may have like a brother um, or such donate the sperm so that the, the gimmick material from her family remains within the actual um, reproduction process. So uh, nonetheless, uh, from this, especially when it comes in terms of somebody who has a serious disease that they don't want to pass on, regardless of the ethic, one, I'm, I'm always, always trying to show the weakness in arguments. They will argue that this saves lives because otherwise it could be that the child is born with a genetic defect that they will not survive. So therefore doing this saves lives. Without commenting on the ethic of that particular um, procedure or making any judgment on it, let's just look at it this way. Um, future people um, will exist. So if you could do something when, when you already have, say, um, a fertilized embryo, and you're doing your best in order to uh, fix whatever pathology might be present and able to be fixed, we can call that life-saving. But if you're saying that we're doing this, um, and the person is always potential, in other words, no one has been conceived at this point, then that is a dependent existence, and it's not life-saving. So I make this comment without any judgment on the particular process itself, but to simply say that the argument that doing this um, saves lives um, otherwise, this child would have been born in a situation where they would not be able to survive much past birth is not a very good argument. Um, this is a philosophy course, so we do our best to try to at least um, analyze these things logically. As we look at how one goes about selecting these embryos and try to tie that to the dignity of uh, a living human person, you're going to have to determine exactly where your values lie on this and what the goal is of each technological intervention. So there's always going to be necessary ethical considerations, um, and it always comes down at least at one level to the cost. So any time that you're thinking of doing some sort of uh, genetic testing or genetic screening on embryos, you'll know, have to realize that you know, the test itself could be you know, over $200, and the biopsy, which is going to be required, is going to be 300. So this is per embryo. Now, I'm sure there might be some rate reduction if one's doing 10 or 11 at a time. Um, but nonetheless, so the ethical considerations that you're going to have to keep in the back of your mind is we can never get away from what constitutes the human person. And by that, I mean person. So we are beyond um, biological life. We're beyond the classification of human. Um, and this is the realm of philosophy and theology to try to determine what exactly is the um, concept of personhood. In other words, remember we at least looked at whether or not it was built on some capacity or whether there was various criteria that were used or that if a human person, I'm sorry, if a human uh, life was always a person by nature. So you're going to have to develop the rationale for what this is. Um, if this is left undone, it's going to bring up contradictions in your stance later on. Um, the other thing is you're going to have to ask, also ask what constitutes health and wellness. If we're going to do genetic screening, um, I would know firsthand that, and it should be obvious, that individuals who are deaf would not consider 
um, a child who is deaf to be some sort of lack of um, health. Um, as a matter of fact, it's part of their deaf community. And if you know anybody who has a person with cystic, um, let's say with Down syndrome, um, oftentimes these individuals are, you know, without being romantic about it because there is a, issues with their health, but they're the kindest, loving people you know, that we can have. So um, instances where, say, a particular um, country, I'm thinking uh, Northeastern Europe, where they have almost no births with Down syndrome because they've all been weeded out. So we'll have to ask, you know, other value questions. Um, do these things become a burden on the family? Why would they be called a burden? Obviously, it's not it's going to be as easy, but is that how we look at each other that may not fit into a particular um, way? And also, um, in society in general, if we say they become a burden to society, also there we'd ask, well, what role does society have to take care of those less fortunate? And if we're going to try to weed some of these out, what exactly kind of society are we trying to produce? It's always going to be the people who have power and who have some sort of, um, you know, um, majority that are going to always place themselves into categories that are not seen as the fringes. So the people on the fringes will always get, um, let's say, reduced. Um, also, this is just something to consider because it's come up. Um, Regardless of your ethic on this, there is a case where a 17-year-old realized that she would have been aborted, and because she was, and she's had a lifetime of um, medical trauma and pathology, and uh, is suing her mother for actually bringing her into life. So all of these things become necessary considerations, which most people just sort of like lay off to the side. So always consider the goals in whatever you're doing. So let's talk first about um, pre-genetic screening. Now, this would be useful for to try to determine whether or not um, you're a carrier of cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, um, muscular dystrophy, etc. Right. So you're looking at the number of chromosomes. Now, the reality is is that well, mosaic cells. In other words, there are some cells that if a biopsy is taken, um, just like a like a cancer biopsy, it could be that they have a tumor and they pull a biopsy off and they find that it is cancer or it is not, no, I'm sorry, they find that it is not cancer. It could be that it's, a, it's not entirely cancer and they simply drew the biopsy from a part of the tumor that doesn't um, indicate any abnormality. The same thing with cells by themselves. Um, some are normal uh, within them. There could be some that have both normal and abnormal um, aspects and depending on where they pull the biopsy from, you could be getting here what we'd call false positive. As far as um, pregenetic diagnosis, here again we're looking for genetic abnormalities uh, prior to implantation. Um, you could might understand this in looking at the overall health of the embryo. So anything that might increase uh, the success of the implantation, because just in normal situations, not all conceptions result in an implantation. So um, in other words. Oftentimes, people have what we would call spontaneous abortion, more colloquially uh, miscarriages, and it could be unknown to the actual mother. So there was, so real quick, you have um, sexual intercourse. Uh, it could be that, like, let's say uh, the sperm does make its way up to the fallopian tube, and there is um, fertilization, and then as the um, embryo travels down, or whatever you want to say to the death point, the oocyte, as it travels down through the fallopian tube, it may or may not implant to the endometrium wall, the uterine wall, and then they would just simply come off in um, menses at that point. So when you're doing these screenings and diagnosis, let's be very clear that we're not talking about these on our children. That's really not part of the argument. So everything that we hear on the news about something like that is really um, so futuristic, it's hard for us to take it seriously at this point. Um, because you simply cannot go in and change one thing. Everything is not just interconnected, but there are various processes that flow from all these different um, genes um, that you could not simply um, only only um, try to control one aspect without it not having some other um, unforeseen um, effect that we simply do not want to get into. But you could at least try um, for a, a particular child. So you, you could look at sex here um, 
and such. And you could say, well, I, you know, I don't want a child with cystic fibrosis. Now, something to consider here is that this does have a consumer sort of attitude towards it. I think it's fair to say that. Um, in other words, the prospective parents are choosing what they want. But either through mosaic cells or just that, you know, science is not always 100%. It could be that the child has developed something else or that the child has developed the disease regardless. Um, would that be a buyer's remorse at that point? So you'd have to think, in what relationship does the, um, the donor and the family have to this um, prospective child? And if the child does not come out how they expect, um, let's even say that you went to a sperm bank and you found out that the sperm that was using for your donation, um, the person's highly educated, they have a good genetic health, um, they come from an intact family. They don't have any signs of um, uh, let's see, uh, um, hostility or aggravation. They uh, seem to otherwise just be the kind of person you would like your child to um, mimic, but it doesn't turn out that way, right? Um, if expectations are not fulfilled, how would that affect the um, parent-child relationship? Something to keep in the back of our heads. Now let's get into the issue of personhood and bodily autonomy. Now what you're going to find here, as with most all ethical things, is one, they're competing goods. So right here we have an ontological aspect of who is this unborn, and then the woman who rightly has um, a degree of bodily autonomy. So um, what I want to start out here is, remember I began this by just mentioning something about procreation and reproduction. And the reason why I brought that up is because there are ways to approach this or ways that some people approach that, that will not ever lead to um, even fruitful conversation. In other words, if somebody starts out by saying, well, I believe in the Bible and the Bible says this, and you would find uh, you know, various degrees of opposition to abortion. We're just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to try to define them from you know, any of the monotheistic religions, um, Christianity, Judaism. Uh, Muslim it varies, but nonetheless. Um, so if somebody were to make a dogmatic statement like that, um, there's no argument that you can really use that's going to have you engage that individual. Hence, it's dogmatic. But the seculars can be as dogmatic as that. So if somebody were to say, and I've seen these memes out there, that unless you have a uterus, you have no say in what happens here. Um, that's a dogmatic statement. Um, because it doesn't really get to the bottom of what we're trying to talk about here. Um, it starts out, if anything starts out, with a statement that seems to end it. You know that you're in a dogmatic uh, argument. And the dogmatic argument could be in a religious context or it could be in a secular context. So we're going to try to avoid both of those. So let's define our term of abortion here as talking about any pro procured, in other words, you went to get it, and it's culpable, so you're guilty for this. I mean, by guilt, I mean you're responsible. Let's put it that way. Um, whether it's spontaneous or not, a prenatal termination of, termination of human life. So even a woman who is pregnant, and either through use of um, drugs, bodily harm, throwing themselves down the steps, you know, they would be responsible for that termination. They would not be responsible if they were in an accident, you know, a vehicle accident, or something like that. So we're only talking about here about procured abortions, and somehow the person is culpably um, spontaneous prenatal termination of the human life. Anything else will just leave go um, and not make it part of our ethical evaluation. Something to be said about embryonic development. Um, it was thought in most of the ancient world, and probably up through the medieval period, that um, the term semen in Latin simply means seed, so that the semen contained all of that was necessary for life, and the woman was the fertile soil. And if that sounds odd to us, it's not unlike how we would see, um, you know, other living things grow, fruit, you know, trees and such, and, and tomato plants or all be plant seed into the soil. So it wasn't until um, much later that they realized how exactly fertility works, um, the role of sperm, um, that the woman had eggs, and how after fertilization, the, the implantation and such. So we have to be very careful if we try to go back and um, make judgments um, on how ancients thought against or for abortion. So even within early Christianity, um, they 
didn't think that the human life became a person until what was known as quickening, until there was some movement. Um, because that, as long as there was animation, then there was a soul. So the word anima is the Latin word for soul, and we get animation and animal from that. So obviously there was something that was enlivened there. So prior to that, they did not consider it a human person, therefore an abortion prior to that, well, any death of the prenatal life prior to that was not an abortion. Um, but let's not, that's not really comparing apples with apples. So we're not here to work that out. We're just here to understand that it, it developed over time. Today, we have good knowledge on it. Now, bodily autonomy is uh, linked to privacy. So when most people in the abortion debates start to speak about bodily autonomy and how the law states it, they leave it as it's a woman's body and she has a right to do what she wants with it. Now, I'm not here to debate on that, but that's not exactly how it worked out. So, prior to 1965, and this goes all the way back uh, at least through the 19, early 1900s, there was a law against transporting any obscene material across state lines. And that obscene material included what we would call pornography, but it also included birth control. So I just have to say something real quick here. Um, so back in the mid-1800s, if you ever heard the term Malthusian, um, there was a man, Thomas Malthus, who um, basically made the argument that the earth would not be able to sustain the growing population. Um, there would be mass starvations and such. So if you ever heard the term Malthusian, it's about that dire uh, predictions. And then in the early 1900s, with Margaret Sanger, uh, who was the founder, of the, well, the originator of Planned Parenthood, they had developed a way that birth control could be used in order to limit births. So if, just thinking like how we sometimes worry about um, terrorism now off and on, or, or illicit gun use, or maybe if you grew up in the 80s, you know, in the 70s, you're worried about nuclear war and such. So it, this overpopulation was in the air. If you're going to have um, a, a, the fear of overpopulation, what you want to do is you want to control who's being born. So if you go and read Margaret Sanger's um, Birth Control League uh, papers, they're available um, through PDFs on the Internet, you'll see what they were attempting to do was to create a race of thoroughbreds. In other words, we have to make sure that the unfit do not procreate and that the fit do um, reproduce and therefore um, contraception must be used to control that. So this was the beginning of the eugenics movement. So everything that we hear of the horrors in, um, in the Nazi Holocaust, which was terrible, if you go down to the Holocaust Museum in um, Washington, D.C., you'll see at least one or two plaques who state very clearly that those eugenic laws in Germany started in the United States. Now, after the horrors of the Holocaust were discovered, there was a name change with um, from the Birth Control League to Planned Parenthood and such, um, but nonetheless. Um, so Margaret Sanger continued his fight for birth control, um, and up until 1965 it was illegal. But in a landmark case, Griswold versus, versus Connecticut, it was determined that under the right to privacy um, in the Bill of Rights, the, um, the, a couple, only a married couple, is able to use contraception in their bedroom. So there is no explicit right to privacy. Um, it's found in what's known as the penumbra. It's like the shadow of it. So nonetheless, um, you know, sardisis, once a law is determined, then that becomes used otherwise. So it was, I think, 1972 until contraception became legal for unmarried um, women to use. So this established the right to privacy. By the time you get to the landmark case Roe v. Wade in 1973, this then extended or connected that right to privacy from Griswold versus Connecticut to Roe v. Wade. So when somebody talks about Roe v. Wade giving women the right to have an abortion, it is, but not based on bodily autonomy. It's based on the right to privacy. So um, even if something, like it, I understand that it's, threatened today. So even if it were overturned, um, this doesn't necessarily mean, besides the fact that it would only go to the states, um, this could make a more robust case. In other words, even uh, Justice Ruth Gader Ginsburg did not think that was a very solid argument. 
Um, and her fear was is that it never, the argument that people think is that Roe v. Wade gave the woman the right to an abortion. It didn't. It framed the right to abortion underneath the woman's right to privacy, and she thought that would be susceptible um, to being overturned. Um, okay, we'll leave it at that. Doe v. Bolton was another one that very few people know about, but it's obviously another hallmark and landmark case, and it was decided on the exact same day. Um, now, what it did was it defined what was the life of the mother. So, in other words, um, if abortion was going to be legal, um, illegal, up to, up to a certain time, except for the life of the mother... When you and I hear the term life of the mother, we immediately think that she will die. So that is true. The physical um, health of the mother is the concern. But Doe v. Bolton um, made it much broader than that. So um, if the woman doesn't think she has the emotional wherewithal, if she is not sure how um, she's going to be able to take care of this child plus other children, if she may not have the money for you know, the pregnancy or to raise the child, all of those things fall underneath the term life of the mother. So it's not a matter of whether or not you, a person thinks, well, a woman should have an abortion regardless. Um, it's up to her. It's her body. Um, when you hear people argue, except in cases of life of the mother, and you, sometimes you hear it in cases of, like, say, rape or incest even, too. We'll talk about that real briefly. Um, it's just important to know that life of the mother does not simply mean physical. Uh, before I follow up on that, real quick about rape and incest. Um, incest is really just a term that, quite frankly, that may sound odd at first hearing, has nothing to do with the argument. Um, if the incest was non-consensual, then it's rape. It's just a form of rape, an egregious form of rape. But it's not a separate type of act. It's a rape that was between, you know, um, uh, let's say, intersanguine relations. If the incest was consensual, then what are we talking about here? Now, it may f seem odd to you to think that there can be consensual incest, but that's another topic. Um, there's plenty of that. People in even other countries especially fight the, um, the laws that would not allow, um, you know, say, relatives with close sanguinity to marry. And, you know, they're saying, why not? Um, if, if you marry who you love, then what does it matter if you're related too close or even brother and sister, something like that. But we're not here to talk about that. Let me say something about the physical. Two things here is that even those who support, um, or let's say those who oppose abortion, do not think that um, the baby needs to be saved and the mother has to be left to die. That's what we call simply a, a ignorantia lanci. It's a straw man argument. Um, that's not their, their point. In other words, it, this is expectant care. So, for instance, what they're trying to come at here is that, you know, how can we keep both of these people alive? If it comes down to the point where only one can survive, then you're into triage. Um, this would be no different than if you were on a battlefield as a, you know, um, an RN or something, and you, you know, do not save one person, even though you might in other circumstances, um, but you go to somebody who you can give better care to. Um, it, it's not intended. So it's just, it's not a good way to make the argument, but all these things usually enter the discussion somehow, so I wanted to at least bring them up. The other thing is the principle of double effect. In other words, the principle of double effect, which I think we covered at least when we were talking about non-maleficence as a principle, remember that it has to have four different um, aspects to it. Um, the object, you know, has to be good or neutral. Um, the bad effect can't have to be foreseen but not intended. The bad effect can't come from the good effect, and that's be some proportionate good. So let me give you a scenario where the principle of double effect would, would work even for a person who was opposed to an abortion. If a woman comes in with a cancerous uterus and she is pregnant and the, the physician says there's no way that if we do anything right now to treat this cancer, this child will survive. If we do not treat this cancer, the chances of you surviving, you know, say two years afterwards is so low. So this is a life and death situation. So if the woman is treated, let's, let's lay it out. What is the object here? You need to remove this diseased organ. It has to be surgically removed. And we know that the child is attached inside. So that's the bad effect. It's going to be the death of the child. It's foreseen, but it's not intended. You have no way to save the both. So here you have to pick one, you have to pick 
one of the two. And if a mother does want to be heroic in a letter, that is her call. Um, but there's no, there's no need for that, and there's certainly no, even for those who um, are opposed to abortion, there's no ethical judgment that makes that mandatory. Um, and the healing of the cancer is not the result of the death of the child, and the proportion between the mother and the child are at the very least equal. Um, so that's something to keep in the back of your minds. Now, um, without making this go too long, let me add at least uh, just a couple of things before we wrap this up. Uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson made this argument um, for autonomy. Um, in other words, a woman's right to have an abortion. And the way that she did it was she offered this argument that women have a property interest in their own bodies. Right? So the fetus, this is how she placed it, is a trespasser on the woman's body. Um, the woman, therefore, entitled to rid herself of this intrusion, which is the fetus intrusion. So what she does is she uses the analogy of a violinist to illustrate her point. So Here's what she says. You know, somebody uh, abducts you out of a van, right? And you find yourself um, back to back with this unconscious violinist who's extremely famous. In other words, everybody wants to save this violinist. But the violinist has a fatal kidney ailment, and you're the only one who has the right blood type to help. So, she says, the society of music lovers, they kidnap you, um, and you are involuntarily um, plugged, you know, you know, to this person with tubes and such. And if you unplug yourself, that person is going to die. But if you just stay there for nine months, tethered to this individual, then you both will live. Is it morally wrong for you just not to walk away from this? So this is her argument on whether or not a woman has the, um, the moral, um, let's say, um, the moral imperative to stay um, tethered to this in, on this unborn. Um, criticism of it is, is the relationship between a mother and a child is not quite the same as between um, a stranger and an, and an abducted person. Uh, maybe if the woman was raped, you can make that conversation. So nonetheless, it's a very um, a, a important argument that's been made over the years, and I thought I should at least share it with you on that regard. Now, when I talk about the competing goods, what I mean is there's always going to be some instance between this bodily autonomy and ontological argument. Um, and the problem is is when these two things are um, argued in isolation. So when a person just says, you know, um, pro-life, which I already explained to you the, the problems with that, um, but nonetheless, um, or if somebody were to say, look, it's, you know, um, my body, my choice. These things, we have to find a language that we can... Um, come to, together, at least if not to share a conclusion or a judgment, to at least be engaged in the conversation. So that's the idea. So if we're going to talk about, um, let's say, the ontological aspect of it, you know, when does the human life, which, again, let's just put that to the side that nobody's arguing this is a human life. We're only trying to get down to what constitutes personhood, and then we want to be consistent. So whatever we choose here, we're going to have to stick to uh, the end-of-life issues, which we'll get to shortly. Um, if we're talking about a heartbeat, um, it could differ. It could be up to six weeks, or it could be ten weeks. So there's like a heart tube that begins spontaneously, like like by week five, and by week six the, the heart chambers are formed. By weeks nine and ten, you can detect a heartbeat. Does that constitute personhood? Um, or when the fetal life um, can have re some receptors, at least in the face, that we respond to touch. That's at week at eight. Um, by, it takes to week 32 until all the bodies have that ability. But at least in the face, it's um, up to that point. Or um, amniotic fluid, um, the fetal life will experience taste uh, between 13 and 15 weeks. By the time you, um, you talk about pain, and oftentimes this comes up, and this is a controversial one because it's very difficult to um, determine. But pain is typically associated with the development of the cortex. Um, that's at 24 weeks. Um, but neuroscience cannot rule out pain that may occur even in the gestational window of as you know, early as 12 weeks. In other words, at what level do, we, do they start feeling pain? So if this is going to be an abortion, um, obviously the child is you know, um, not anesthetized prior. Do they feel pain? Another, um, another instance of personhood could be viability, right? So maybe as low as 22 weeks, but even at 24 weeks, this does not guarantee that the child will live extra uterine outside the, the womb. But by that point, um, it's likely that the, the child could live on their own. Now, 
birth is obviously there too, and that's the legal one that's connected to Roe v. Wade and such. But even philosophers that are pro-abortion find just the moment of birth to be a somewhat um, odd one to place personhood on. Um, and you're just talking, it's, it's, it's not a person, you know, as long as its head is in the vaginal cavity, that's how it would be legally. And the minute the head evacuates the vaginal cavity and then it's a person, it seems like an odd way. Um, we're not talking their capacity criteria or nature, really. We're just talking location. Uh, the other consideration is consciousness. So when does a child um, uh, um, understand that they exist separate from the world? That's about five months of age, extra uterine. Um, which means individuals like Peter Singer, um, the bioethicist from uh, Princeton University, he has no issues, at least he knows it's not legal in the United States, but he'd have no issues to continue um, an abortion up to two or three or four months of age um, because they're still not persons at that point. Um, oftentimes we would use this uh, criteria for end of life when a person loses consciousness or any ability to regain consciousness. Um, are they no longer there? This is why you simply can't get around um, this notion of personhood per se. It, it always comes up, at least on, on some level. So without making this any longer than it has to be, let me at least say this. Um, you have at least three general understandings here. In other words, if you're going to base your argument for or against abortion on personhood, then you are going to determine when that is, and then that is an ontological. That's what is this thing, right? That precedes any liberty that um, anybody else has, because even autonomy stops at the threshold of another person. The other one is uh, reproductive freedom. How far, um, even using technology, would you consider that an individual can go in order to have a child? So, um, it's something to consider, which is why I wanted to at least include a, an aspect of reproductive technologies in today's discussion. And the last one is autonomy. Nobody's arguing that um, men or women have um, an ability to claim autonomy to themselves, but to what extent does that go? It certainly doesn't extend to self-harm, and it absolutely does not extend to um, the harm of another. Um, an interesting little side note here is that if in 1978 the first uh, test tube baby, now in vitro fertilization child, was born, this gave the um, woman the ability to have a baby without sexual intercourse with a male. But she did need to carry the child. Well, um, within the last two or three years, um, down in, I think, Penn Med in Philadelphia, there was a lamb that was brought through three weeks, three months gestation in an artificial womb. Which means that in the next 30 to 40 years, it's not unrealistic to think that we could not have artificial wombs for the unborn. Which means that now a male with a donated ovum could actually still bring forth a child without having um, a surrogate. Um, it also will challenge issues of autonomy. Uh, because then the woman who's required to carry the child, as in Judith Jarvis Thompson's argument, no longer stands as a necessary um, way to complete um, you know, birth. So nonetheless, I know this is a little bit longer than normal. Um, again, I, it's not exhaustive, but I wanted to at least be thorough enough to address what I thought were some of the major components um, to these various arguments. Have a great day.